All right, Dick Couch, welcome to the show. Thank you. So you've written several books about America's special operating forces. What got you started with that? Well, I, uh, I, I've i had a, a very interesting service career in that I spent time in both the underwater demolition and SEAL teams. And subsequent to that, I went and spent about four years at the Central Intelligence Agency as a paramilitary officer. And I thought, well, with this background, I'd, I would love to write a book. So I started on a spy book and I was partway through it when I saw a book on Navy SEALs on the shelf. And I picked it up and I read it and it was, wasn't about Navy SEALs. It was about some very brave sailors who were on river patrol boats. So I called the editor up and I said, gee, this these aren't Navy SEALs. These are somebody else. And he said, well, Navy SEALs are really hot right now. And I thought, okay, I think I get it. So I, I started writing about a Navy SEAL story. It turned out to be SEAL Team 1, and I never looked back from there. And, and why do you think it's important for civilians to understand how you know the Navy SEALs or other special operating forces work? Well, I'm, before 9-11, they were becoming more important, but they were another member in the mix of our our ability to project power overseas and a part of our Department of Defense. Since 9-11, they've taken a more central role in the global war on terror. I think that they maybe get a little bit too much attention, quite often at the expense of some very capable and brave and much needed Army, Navy, and Air Force Marine personnel. But they seem to be the force, force du jour right now. And, you know, there's, uh, again, I'm, I'm certainly not the only guy writing about Navy SEALs now. And then they've, they've made some very successful film, films on SEAL operations. Well, as you said earlier, you know, you found that book that the publisher purported to be about Navy SEALs, but it wasn't about Navy SEALs. So it seems like there's a lot of misconceptions that people have about special operating forces. What are some of the most common ones that you've come across as you've talked to civilians about about your work? Well, I think that special operations across the spectrum are various communities, and the primary ones being Navy SEALs, Army Special Forces, the 75th Ranger Regiment, which is an Army organization, and the Marine Special Operations Command. Each one of them are separate cultures. They have separate missions. They there's some commonality in how they execute their missions, but they they do very different things. So I think that, uh, and they've grown tremendously since 9-11. And they're very much, you know, even as we draw down perhaps in Syria and uh, Afghanistan, those special, those special operators are still hard at work overseas. And so you, know, you mentioned some how they're different, they had different cultures. So how, how do they differ from each other? in sort of broad strokes? Well, perhaps the, let me start with the Navy SEALs. They have, as many of them admit, they're jack of all trades and master of none. They have a maritime portfolio, which means they have to be good in the water and they have a lot of their training is focused around the water. It takes about a third of the time to keep those combat swimmer skills intact and, and up to speed there, even though they we don't hear about them being used very often. They've got air operations to train for. They've got land warfare to train for. So there's a very broad spectrum. It takes about a year and a half to train, basically train and qualify a Navy SEAL. And, and then perhaps another year of training with his operational unit before he's ready to deploy. So it's a long training pipeline. The specialty of SEALs are maritime operations, but they've been primarily used in a direct action role, which means they're they're out there uh, on patrol looking for bad guys and dealing with them. Army Special Forces, which is another culture in itself, but I, and I've said this much to the chagrin of my fellow SEALs, I think they're the most important special operator on the battlefield because their primary goal is to train other militaries, other security forces. So if they do their job right and they do it well, then we get to come home. So I think they're very important. They take on a lot of combat roles and direct action missions like SEALs, but they're primarily trainers. The third special operations component I'll mention are the 75th Rangers. 
The 75th Rangers are the best light infantry in the world. They have a very short training period, perhaps two months, to take a young infantryman and make him into an army ranger. And then he may have four or five months of pre-deployment workout, but they don't have, they don't do a lot of things, but what they do is light infantry work. They're very good at conducting combat assaults, and they do that very, very well. The fourth member of the special operations mix or in the ground combat area is the Marine Special Operations Command with the Marine Raiders. And they do, in some ways like the SEALs, they do a bit of everything, over-the-beach work, in-water work. They're more of an agile expeditionary force, and they do spend a lot of time, like Army Special Forces, in training other security forces. But next to SEALs, I would say that, you know, the Army Special Forces and the Marine Raiders are among the most highly trained special operations ground combatants that we have. Well, I'd like to dig in more into the Army Rangers here in a because you wrote a book about Sua Sponte, about them and about their training and their culture. But before we get there, like, how did, what were the origins of, you know, America's special operating forces? Did like each branch, did it happen sort of organically? And they said they, were, they, they saw a need where they needed something a little more specialized. And then they, you know, sort of over time formalized it. Or was it from the get-go, they, they knew they needed a very formal, structured special operations and they, they started it? Well, I think that, I mean, we can trace the origins of special operations back to Richard Rogers and Rogers Rangers that we remember from Spencer Tracy in in, uh, Northwest Passage. But each of the components today has kind of their roots. As far as the SEALs go, they came from the Navy frogmen of World War II after the landings at Tarawa and the need for hydrographic data because we lost an awful lot of Marines because we didn't know the the coastal conditions that they were going to have to advance across in order to make these landings. So that's where the birth of the Navy SEALs happened in 1943 after the landings of Tarawa and we needed Navy frogmen. So that's where the SEALs came from. Army Special Forces, they they can kind of trace their roots maybe back to the Special operators in the Civil War and the, the the men who operated behind the lines. Formerly, they were kind of a Cold War organization. As we built a special forces capability to go behind the lines in case the Soviets came in and took Europe. Then we'd have some people to go behind the lines and create partisan forces. So they've always been a training component. But they have their roots in the Cold War. And certainly, they were very well deployed in Vietnam The Army Rangers, again, they're just an outgrowth of light infantry that is, by extension, has been almost seconded from the Army to the Special Operations Command, and they rotate soldiers, good soldiers, through the Ranger Regiment back to the Army and back into the Ranger Regiment. The Marines are new to the Special Operations mix. They came about in 2006. Be, you know, uh, Secretary Rumsfeld suggested without taking no for an answer that the Marines needed a special operations component. There were Marine Raiders, two or three battalions of Marine Raiders during the Second World War. They were stood up at the insistence of President Roosevelt, whose son was uh, a battalion commander of the Marine Raiders. The Marines have had kind of a checkered career with special operations and and special units in general. The Marines feel that they, in the, in among themselves, are special, and I have to agree with them. They are special, but th- they've built a very robust capability since 2006, and now I think they're a very valued member of the special operations ground combat mix. So uh, all these different organizations and forces have different goals, different objectives, different cultures. Would you say since 9-11 that there's been more integration? Like you, you see SEALs working with Army and Rangers, like there's more, I don't know what's the right word I'm looking for, a collaboration, I, I guess is the right word. Mm. I, I don't think so. They they tend to operate with their own. They prepare as a team. They're a very team centric organization. They sometimes, sometimes some of the other ground combatants will be conducting a direct action mission, and they might use an element of the seventy fifth Rangers as a blocking force. But they typically don't work together per se. I think that has to do with the 
it's it's not that they can't. It's just that they prepare, they know each other, everybody has a role on a certain type of mission, they know how each other's react, they have a commonality in their weapons, how their gear is placed on their body, and how they've trained up to do certain missions in a certain way. They almost don't have to talk to each other. They, they, it's not that they don't operate together, and they have in the past, but by and large, they pretty much st- stick to their own groups when planning and executing special operations. So I'd like to dig deep into the Army Rangers because, you know, as you said, thanks to, I guess, the Osama bin Laden raid, there's been films made about, made about Navy SEALs. A lot of people know about Navy SEALs, but the Army Rangers often get licked over. And I didn't, honestly, before I read Sua Sponte, I knew hardly anything about Army Rangers. I just knew my barber was part of, was an Army Ranger. And that was it because I saw his, his patches on his, on his wall. So let's talk about Ranger School. There's a Ranger School. Right, right, but not everyone who goes through a ranger school is a yeah. ranger. Well, there, there's there is a great misconception about army rangers and ranger school. First of all, ranger school is an army leadership school. It's a very difficult school. It's a hard school. It's it teaches young army officers that even though they haven't slept or eaten, or are very hard pressed, that they can still go out and make decisions, they can fight, and they can lead in very trying circumstances. So it's a leadership school. If you go to Army Ranger School, and you pass it, you are technically Ranger qualified, but you are not an Army Ranger. Army Rangers are those who serve in the 75th Ranger Regiment. They have three infantry battalions, one special troops battalion, and they have a very high standard of in the execution of combat assault and light infantry tactics. Uh, Typically, a young Army Ranger will sign up. He'll go to basic school. He will get his infantry qualification. He'll go to airborne school, and then he'll go to ranger assessment and selection. And it's currently a two-month process. You might think, gosh, that's not too long, two months. But they have quite an attrition. It's a very difficult period of time for these young men, and that attrition is probably 75%. Only 25, 20 or 25 percent will make it to the end. And then they're, they get their tan beret and they are an army ranger. The real making of that army ranger, he's, he's been through the school. We know he's a tough guy, but he really learns how to be an army ranger when he gets his to, to his infantry platoon, his ranger platoon. And, starts working up for combat deployment. When I was with the Rangers, I never met a Ranger first sergeant that didn't have at least 12 combat rotations in. They typically overseas for four months, back for eight, and they go again and again and again. I think one thing that distinguishes Rangers from the rest of the Army and the rest of special operations, they have a very strict adherence to what a being a ranger and doing the right thing. They consider warriorship and the ethos of being a ranger to be a very high calling and they have very high standards and they hold themselves to very high standards. I remember one ranger first sergeant saying to me, our standards are just like army standards. There's no difference, but we enforce them to the letter. And they do. They take a great deal of pride in that. And I have nothing but great things and great admiration for the, uh, that 75th Ranger Regiment. Well, let's talk a little bit more about Ranger assessment and selection. So you said it's two months, high attrition rate. Like, What does that process look like? Is it similar to BUDS or is is it different? It has some similarities to, to BUDS. They, they don't, they have you got to be able to swim 15 yards across the pool. So there is almost no water requirement for them. They're all airborne, qual- you know, have they all been to jump school? But their training is around some very arduous physical examinations. They basically, to, to put it in a nutshell, they go out with, they have a range called coal range, and they go out there for three or four days. And that ranger first sergeant says, you will not become a ranger until you show me you have the heart of a ranger. And they run them right in the ground to see if they have heart. And 
the best thing I can say, it's a test for a man's heart. Past that, the, the, the skill building has to do around combat shooting and shooting with somebody on either side of you at night under certain conditions. They have, you have to have some sense of, of a team and awareness of those around you while you're conducting shooting operations. So it starts them down the road on being a good light infantryman and good at combat assault. And the, again, a great deal of what makes these young men into good rangers are the pre-deployment training and their deployments with the ranger veterans in their, in their ranger platoons and their ranger companies. So just to clarify something, you don't have to go to ranger school and get your ranger tab to do the ranger assessment and selection, correct? No, you don't. And very few are. What will happen as a young man is he will, he will maybe make two or three combat rotations before he goes to ranger school. You can't become uh, an NCO, you know, uh, an E4 sergeant in the ranger regiment unless you have your ranger tab. So these young men, they they all want to go to ranger school. They want to get through that. They have a much high, have much lower attrition rate for the guys from the ranger regiment who go to ranger school. But if you're going to stay in that business and make a career of it and move up through the ranks, you have to have your ranger tab. And they go at great lengths to see that everybody gets there. I might kind of, we've talked about these are the progression of a enlisted soldier in the ranger regiment. Officers are assessed by a different program, and every officer in the Ranger Regiment who rotates in and then rotates out has to have that Ranger tab. And and that includes, uh, I know an officer came in, he was a veterinary, a doctor of veterinary medicine who saw to the uh, canine aspects of the Ranger business, and he he was a, a good officer, but he was he was having to go to Ranger school to become Ranger qualified to serve in the regiment. So in, in Sui Sponte, you kind of highlight different young men who go through ranger assessment and selection. I mean, kind of give us a thumbnail. What are the type of men who are attracted to to doing this? Well, I think that it's kind of the same type that are attracted to all special operations. I think they, they want to serve. They want to be in a unit that's, some, that's special. I think that they, maybe it's proving something to themselves. A lot of them come in because their dads or uncles or or mentors or maybe a high school coach was in the army or was an army ranger and they've seen something in that young man and said, here's something you might want to consider or you might want to do. I get a lot of young men come to me thinking they want to be SEALs and I said, well, that's good and I wish you well and what have you, but uh, take a look at Army Special Forces, uh, the Marines. Uh, but also take a look at uh, the the 75th Ranger Regiment. Uh, that's a great place to, uh, if you want to serve your country and be with a uh, what I consider a high quality organization. I, I can't say enough about the 75th Ranger Regiment. After a Ranger Assessment Selection Program, they start going on combat rotations. And you said that you know some of these guys can go two or three combat rotations before they even start Ranger School. Correct. I mean what. What does a typical combat rotation look like for a ranger? Like, how long are they deployed? They're only, they'll be deployed typically four months. It may, may be if they overlap a little bit, they'll stay for a five month tour or they may shorten it up a little bit, but they're overseas rather quickly, only for about four months, and then they're back for about eight. Uh, but they're making, like I said, when I was with the Ranger Regiment, they were going, some of them were going back on shorter tours than that, but they go back again and again. And one, once more, they, their mission is primarily combat assault. They also have another mission that they train for. It's air, airfield seizure. Uh, it's a very highly orchestrated thing where they parachute in and take over an airfield and land aircraft and, and set up uh, small arms and defensive things so that they can take over an airfield just about anywhere in the world. So they have to have, they maintain that capability, but in the battle space in Afghanistan and Iraq, they're primarily used for combat assault, light, light arms or light, small arms and combat assault. And they're, they're 
work in special operations is primarily as blocking forces for some of our special missions unit and some of uh, and missions that might be conducted by Army Special Forces or SEALs. And do Rangers like stay in a specific like geographic rotation, like or location? I mean, so like sort of like SEALs. There's like SEAL teams where they all kind of sit together in the West Coast or the East Coast, and they well, can train together. Well, the, the Ranger Regiment is is located at Fort Benning. That's where they have their headquarters. They have one battalion at Fort Lewis. The Joint Fort Lewis base in Washington State. They have one battalion at Hunter Army Airfield in Savannah, and one one battalion, actually two battalions, at uh, Fort Benning. And so they're pretty much in those battalions, and they go overseas as a battalion and come back as a battalion. The one special troops battalion has certain capabilities that they will deploy with the other infantry battalions to support them as they need it. And so I imagine in between deployments, there's training that goes on to keep their skills or learn new skills. There is. There, It's constantly, they get a couple of weeks off and then they start back in working up to deploy again. I talked with some of the, the, the some of the platoon officers and platoon sergeants and said, how do these guys measure up, you know, tour after tour? And he says, you know, about 20% of them are really not after their first deployment. We tend to let them go just because they find out not that they're not trying their best, but doing that kind of work takes not only toughness it and skill, it also requires a certain aptitude and talent and not everybody has it. Uh, he might be a, a tough kid who can get through the initial training, but he may just lack what it takes to do the job. It's a skill-based profession they expect certain things out of them on their second and third deployments, and it's not for everybody. So while there's attrition in the basic training, there's also attrition in the operational components because some of them just don't measure up when it comes to doing, you know, running around with auto- automatic weapon at night and shooting with other rangers in close proximity. Is um, like with uh, ranger assessment and selection. Is that something if you wash out because of the you know there's attrition, can you try again? Or like say you get you do that first deployment and they say, well, no, this isn't for you. Can you try again, or is it pretty much a done deal? I think they roll some they roll some back if they're hurt or they're injured or what have you. Uh, I, I've seen that uh, several times. I think that if sometimes somebody is, it's clearly they're not quite up to this. Maybe it's by youth or by conditioning. Uh, they'll go back to the regular unit and try again. And I think the Ranger Regiment prides itself when they have somebody come to that training and it doesn't work out for them that they send that soldier back to his unit better than when they, he came there. So uh, there's some who try it once. If they don't make it, can back, come back and try it again. So besides Iraq and Afghanistan, are there any places where Army Rangers are, you know, part of the 75th, are they're doing a lot of combat rotations? I don't think so. I I, I only know of those deployments in those areas. I can't imagine them not having some presence in North, in Africa, especially North Africa, Northwest Africa, and even S- Somalia type where we have our special operators deployed. I think they deploy in support of special operations wherever they are. And of course, we remember the Battle of Mogadishu where they were primarily Rangers involved in that engagement. So you mentioned Donald Rumsfeld earlier, and I remember back, you know, when the, the lead up to the Iraq and Afghanistan wars and those are going on. There's an emphasis placed on special operations or special operating forces. What role do you see special operating forces playing in the future of America's military? Well, I think that remains to be seen. They have expanded their portfolio to things like weapons of mass destruction and counterinsurgency operations. You know, it, it's, it used to be a, a rather narrow focus. Now it seems to be expanding. I would like to think that, again, this is just my opinion, that <clears throat> as it becomes clear in areas like Syria, Afghanistan, and Iraq, that even if our best efforts are made, there may not be a clear-cut solution or a, a victory or a, a victory to be won 
within those populations. So I would hope that we would scale back some of our deployment there because uh, I'm not sure there's a clear path to victory. There may be some other, there are other issues that are kind of uh, maybe, maybe needs to have more attention. It could be Chinese expansion into Southwest Asia. It could be certain areas of, of Africa. And it could be, you know, certainly the, the Soviets would like to expand into uh, maybe reclaim some of their lost empire. Uh, and we perhaps might need some special operators to train and be ready for those contingencies. Do you see any changes coming to special operating forces and how they operate at all? Or is it sort of more of the same? They're going to stick that ethos that they have because it's worked for, you know, 50, 60, sometimes 100 years. I, I don't know. I think that uh, you know the 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 threat defines the mission and how you train toward it. And uh, we've got some very good mountain fighters and what have you. Army Special Forces will always they're the largest of our ground combat component special operations components. I think there's always going to be a need to engage with and train other security forces, whether it's in South America or Africa or where have you. Or to maybe even train Ukrainian forces against uh, potential Russian aggression there. I think that SEALs probably, you know, they've ignored a lot of their maritime capabilities and and fleet support duties because they've been running around uh, the mountains of the Hindu Kush chasing uh, Taliban irregular. So I think looking, hopefully... You know, and, and as 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 an old warrior here, I'm I'm thinking we I'd like to see have a less deployed presence, a a little bit more of a manageable operations tempo as we deploy these people, so that they're not so hard pressed overseas, and maybe a little more careful aligning of our special operations components that are in line with a more narrow definition of our national interests. You know, you mentioned uh, Army Special Forces, um, how they, they focus a lot on training. That seems like it's a job that requires a lot of soft skills, people skills. I mean, all these jobs, all these special operating forces require those kind of people skills, soft skills. But it seems like Army Special Forces require that especially. Someone who's sensitive to culture and thinking in systems and management. Is that the case? Like that it kind of, does it attract that kind of person? I think it absolutely does. And of course, I mentioned the, it takes about two and a half to three years to make a Navy SEAL. It takes maybe two years to make a special operations soldier. And my definition of a good special op, uh, a good special forces soldier, uh, an Army Green Beret, I mean, he's somebody who's, who's a people person. Uh, he'll stop a car driving down the street just to talk to the driver. What's your name? Where are you going? How are you? What are you up to? It's not that they don't want to do uh, direct actions, but their primary thing is teachers. They have to understand people, understand other cultures. And a lot of their training and their role play and how they go about it is to make that guy a, an outgoing person. I've seen it when the, in special forces training, I've seen uh, Green Beret instructors take a young kid aside and say, look, it, you're a bit of an introvert. That's not going to cut it in the work we have to do here. And I want you going out on the weekends, going into a bar, whether you order a beer or a Coke, it doesn't matter, sit down beside somebody and start talking to them and draw them out and find out where they're from, what they do, what they like, what they don't like, uh, how they vote, what sports teams they root for. But you have to be a people person to survive in that business. Also, I would point out that the average age of a Navy SEAL platoon is maybe 28 or 29 years old, but the average age of a Special Forces A team might be 32 or 33. They're very experienced soldiers, and it takes a while to, to acquire those skills along with certain language capabilities that go with conducting the missions that they have to do. And how long does like a career last for, say, a Green Beret? Well, as long as, I mean, they're, they, they put in 30 years and they may put it even more than 30 years if they are up to it physically. I don't, the physical demands, uh, probably the, on, on a pure pain of meter, pain meter indication would be that Navy SEALs have, is physically is the most grueling of the training pipelines. But special forces and rangers and the Marines are not far behind them in the demands they put on it. And some of these guys, when they get up into their mid-40s, early 40s, mid-40s, 
they have all the tools they need to do this business, but physically they, they just have to work harder at staying fit and staying in shape. Army Special Forces, their business of training others isn't quite so physically demanding as perhaps some of the other disciplines, uh, even with the Marines in their over-the-beach operations and the things that they have to do to be physically fit to do the mission. There's probably not a lot of 50-year-old Army Rangers or Navy SEALs, but you probably see that as a Green Beret. Not so much. I think that, and you know, there there may be some who stay on who have had an enlisted career and then an officer career and have been able to stay on for a while. It just gets harder and harder to stay fit to do those, to do those particular missions, especially if you're in a line combat unit. If you're in one of those operating platoons, uh, you work pretty hard to be able to carry that 40 or 50 pounds of operational gear and to run up and down mountains and to go a couple days without sleep. It wears you down. It, it is a bit of a young man's game, but there's an awful lot of of those guys that are in their mid thirties and early forties that manage to stay on top of their physical conditioning and are still able to, to go out there and perform with the younger men. Someplace people can go to learn more about your work. Well, as far as my work and what I write about it, you can go to www.dickcouch.com and there's kind of a short squib on each of the books I've written. I've been privileged to be able to go to each of the special operations training venues and audit the class with, you know, walk through with a, a, with a number of those going through their basic training and even into their pre-deployment training. So I've been very fortunate to do that. As far as any current official data as to what do you do and where do you go to sign up, I think you go online. Each of the special operations components has a very excellent website that tells you what you need to do and how you need to go about it if you want to be one of them. Past that, there's any number of books out there on on all special operations forces, but I'm proud to say that I'm the only person who's written who's who's attended all four major special operations training basic and advanced training venues and have been able to allow to write about it. Well, Dick Couch, thanks so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. My guest today was Dick Couch. He's the author of several books. Today, we discuss Sua Sponte. It's available on Amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. You can find out more information about his work at his website, dickcouch.com. Also, check out our show notes at aom.is slash armyranger, where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic.